Hey, how's it going? In my last video, I tried out a hardcore Nuzlocke with a randomizer, and honestly I got really lucky with my first few Pokemon, and outside of one minor death early, it was pretty easy, but it just took a lot of time. However, one of my takeaways was Lapras. This beautiful singing Pokemon really impressed me during the run. It has a great special stat, combined with its defense and amazing HP, this thing is just an absolute tank. The one worry I have is that its speed isn't that great. The TMs that it can learn also really surprised me. This thing checks all the marks needed needed for a great solo run, it gets a stabbed ice beam, it gets thunderbolt, and it even gets psychic just for good measure. So the question we are looking to answer today is why no one else has ever done a solo run with this beefy boy. While I personally don't think it can top the tier list, I also didn't think Needle King could either, and like they say, the games aren't played on paper, and it could surprise us all. Before we jump in, I upload solo run content fairly often, so consider subscribing if that is of interest to you. Likes and comments also help out small channels on the algorithm the most. So if you're someone who just doesn't normally interact, just take a second, scroll down, type in turtle shell to let me know that you are enjoying the content and help me out a little bit. Now grab yourself a sodi pop and let's see if Lapras has what it takes to be in the upper echelon of generation 1 solo runs. As usual, I reset for good DVs to get the most out of our Lappy Boy, and I name him Chubb Jr. after the one from the Nuzlocke before getting on with things. The first knock on Lapras is that it only has Water Gun. It's not the weakest move. Lapras does have pretty good special, it does get stabbed, and it does make Brock trivial. Those are all great things, but the main problem we'll run into is the huge drawback of only having 25 PP. I'll touch more on this later. It won't really affect this first part of the game. As for leading up to Brock, I don't do minimum battles. Like with Nidal King, I immediately do the optional rival battle. Lapras is in the slow leveling group, and that means I'm at a meager level 5 going into this. The first attempt, I just get soloed by the Pidgey, and I'm thinking that this one is going to be really rough and I might have to skip it, but it turns out not to be the case. On the second attempt, I'm able to get past the Pidgey, I avoid any annoying sand attacks by the grace of God, and I get through the Squirtle, still in green health. There's not a whole lot of strategy other than just growling it down so that its moves do zero damage to me and eventually water gun does get it down I get to level 7 once the battle is over from there the 25 power points of water gun isn't an issue I skip wild battles for the most part and I easily get past the three bug catchers in Viridian Forest as well as the junior trainer in Brock's gym before going for the badge and unsurprisingly Lapras does not struggle here water gun against two Pokemon that have a double weakness to it means that this battle is over in seconds and it's about as easy as a Brock fight is gonna get the problematic part of Lapras's run is the next stretch of the game and I'll go over my strategy as well as other things I tried before I did this run. First off, I do buy an extra escape rope in the Pokemon and Pewter, and this is important to my overall strategy here. And this is where having to rely solely on the 25 PP of Water Gun, as well as the slow leveling group, really slow you down, pun intended. I'm not sure if there's a faster way to do this, but I did minimum battles initially just to make sure that I have access to the pre-Mount Moon Poke Center, and then I use up all the remaining power points to finish off the trainers before it. In Inside of Mount Moon, I ultimately decided to clear the first floor until I ran out of power points. I use my escape rope, I replenish my PP, and then I finish up heading towards Cerulean. Remember that the slow leveling group combined with most Pokemon needing to be around level 18 give or take to complete rival number 2 is what made me make the decision to do the extra battles, risking rival number 2 being too difficult and having to grind only one patch of grass before Cerulean just sounds awful. I will say that I initially had another strategy that I was bouncing around and that was battling every single thing I could, including Nugget Bridge and the route to Bill's house until I hit level 25 so that I have Body Slam for Misty, but that took an extreme amount of time, but eventually I do get through Mount Moon, and this is what felt like the big problem solve of the Lapras run, but eventually I do make my way to Cerulean. And I've spoke about how only having Water Gun is Lapras's huge problem for the run, and how I tested out things before trying to rush level 25 so I can get Body Slam for Misty, right? Well, the more efficient way and the better solution that I found was to immediately tackle Misty before rival number two at all. And you may think that this battle would be rough, but it's actually not too bad. Lapras has extreme bulk and a ridiculous HP stat, and when you combine that with the fact that Misty's Pokemon will only go for tackle, it just comes down to a battle of attrition. This does take an exceptional amount of time, 
Um, but I did learn Sing at level 16, and while it's not really that reliable, it does mitigate a lot of the potential damage. Staryu isn't bad at all, but like always, it's the star me that's the huge slog. It has a high crit rate, and it does take me some time to wrestle control of the battle and start to outpace it, but eventually my weak and resisted water guns do the trick and it does get us through to obtain the second badge. The important part of doing Misty immediately is that we get Bubble Beam. It's an obvious upgrade to water gun, but more importantly, it nearly doubles our PP reserves, which means I can finally not worry about healing as much and hopefully turn around the slow start. Next up is rival number two, and it's an easy fight because I make quick work of the Pidgeotto and that means no sand attacks here today. It uses a quick attack first, and since I outspeed, that means I do a bubble beam and then a water gun on the following turn does take it out. From there, the rest of the fight flows pretty simple and I don't have any troubles. Using water attacks against Squirtle isn't ideal, but it's good enough to get through this one. Afterwards, the route to Bill's house is simple, and from this point on, I start doing minimum battles to try to overcome what's been a relatively slow start similar to Starmie through the first quarter of the game. Now it's time for the SSN, and I actually skip Body Slam since we'll learn it naturally very soon, and I only get the rare candy behind the gentleman with fire Pokemon. Now it's time for rival number three. This fight is virtually identical to the second rival fight. I get past the pesky Pidgeotto, and from there the rest of the fight isn't a challenge at all. I do hit that crucial level 25, and that gets us access to Body Slam, which will be very useful for some hefty neutral damage against things with high special or things that resist water. Once I'm done, I see the SSN off, and it's time to take on Lieutenant Surge. This fight was easy enough. At the end, I do take some damage and I'm paralyzed, but I'm able to get through in one attempt. The takeaway is something that I'll probably touch on later, and that is while Lapras is a tank and has really good stats, there are a lot of times where it just barely misses one hitting a Pokemon here, or maybe outspeeding a Pokemon there. These are minor details, but over the course of a run where I'm mainly doing the minimum battles after Bubble Beam, these are the things that'll start to add up over the average three hour speed runs that I do. After the fight, I get access to Thunderbolt and I've said it once and I'm gonna say it again this is a top three coverage move and one of the most valuable TMs in the game so from there Lapras is also really great at making Rock Tunnel a very simple task so let's just skip ahead to Celadon the first order of business is to get a couple of those sweet fresh waters and turn in one for Ice Beam and that's another top three coverage move that gives us another power buck from there I pick up Fly and I immediately infiltrate the rocket hideout we are still on minimum battles if you are wondering so it isn't that long before I make it to our first run in with Giovanni. There's not much to say about this one. Two double weak to water Pokemon and a Kanga 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 Skun if uh, you get that original anime reference. Anyways, uh, this is just a speed bump in the road as we get closer to the midway point of the game. Obviously, we'll be skipping Erica for now. I don't think Razor Leaf would feel that great, but in the interim, it's time for a quick trip to Saffron to pick up Psychic before flying over to Lavender Town to face rival number four. And you might be like me and be thinking, wow, Lapras has a near perfect moveset and you'd be right I don't have psychic learn just yet because bubble beam still has some solid use but it's similar to Nidoking King or Starmie it has just a lot of answers for virtually all situations that the game's gonna throw at you it's just a shame that it takes about halfway through the game to reach that point either way you've watched the fourth rival battle in the background Lapras is very well equipped and makes it look very easy but most Pokemon do when I finish up the tower I hop my bike I head down towards Fuchsia I pick up the two remaining HMs in the Safari Zone then I teach psychic to Lapras and now it's time for Koga. The battle itself isn't too bad. I have Psychic against his full poison team and that's just to be expected. The problem Lapras has that I've talked about already is that the slow leveling group means that I'm only level 35 and while Lapras has a good special stat it's just a smidge under the elite levels so that means that Pokemon usually take an extra hit to go down. This is a knock on Lapras that I did not see coming when I went over the initial preliminary stuff for the run. And I've touched on it some but it's just these extra turns compared pounding over and over over the course of an entire run that really add up. I'm still doing very well in the run, but this was about the time that I started to doubt if Lapras could be a top tier Pokemon. I'm not going to be using Surf on Lapras' final moveset, so Silphco is the next logical choice. I'm still doing the bare minimum, so I don't even get the rare candy on floor 10, and I immediately go on to rival number 5. This one is always a good test, and Lapras just does great here. I just talked about being a little off of one-shotting things, but I do get a couple of lucky crits in this fight and I one hit everything in this fight. I do think the Pidgeot and the Blastoise would have survived a single attack but those are the ones that I crit on so that's great. Outside of that 
Growlithe and Execute are just unevolved Pokemon and they're weak, and Alakazam is very frail, and that's the reason why I keep Body Slam on this run. Overall, Lapras did about as good as any Pokemon could do in this fight. Next up is Giovanni number two, and I really can't talk this battle down enough. I didn't even heal, I'm poison, I get extremely low, but it's still an easy fight with Lapras' excellent moveset, and I cruise past this one. There are some moments in this fight that suffer from the same lack of raw power like I mentioned with Koga, but it's not too bad. I immediately fight Sabrina next, and it's more of the same. Lapras's subpar speed means most of her Pokemon do get a move off, but luckily it's mainly no damaging moves, although the Venomoth does paralyze me since Psychic's damage was hurt really bad due to Mr. Mime setting up a light screen. When I do make it to the Alakazam, I get the 33% chance to paralyze from a Body Slam, and I take it out shortly after. That's five badges down, and I'm really hustling to try to make up some time from early on. After that, I backtrack to finally pick up Erica, and it's harder than it needed to be because I'm stupid. I forget to heal and cure my paralysis. The takeaway from this fight is just how much of a tank Lapras actually is. Victory Bell does get off its infamous 100% crit razor leaf, and it just tanks it like an absolute champ. I'm over leveled, but it's not really by a ton, and it's very impressive to me. Overall, I do get worryingly low from some pedal dances at the end, but I have super effective moves that eventually get me past this fight despite my idiot mistakes. The last thing I can do from here is take my weekly brisk swim down to Cinnabar to work on our 7th badge. Now here's something I never mention, but it applies for pretty much all the slow leveling group Pokemon that I've done. And I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but repels only work on Pokemon that are up to your level. This means that in runs where I'm doing the bare minimum, I'll get annoying random encounters like you're seeing here. I still forgot to heal. Look how low I am. It's really scary, but it's just a fun little fact that I don't think I've ever mentioned it in any of my videos, so I'm doing it here. It's just really annoying. After everyone's favorite question, Tombstoner, brother. It's time for Blaine, and since I'm not using Surf, this one isn't that easy. Only being level 40 presents its own problems, but the Growlithe and Ponyta are just whatever. They aren't too strong, and they're just minor nuisances. The Rapidash is where the problems come in. Fire Spin is a broken move just like with Rap, and since I'm never going to outspeed it, I'm at the mercy of its 70% accuracy if I ever want to get a turn. Since Lapras is also half Ice type, that means I have to only take neutral damage from Fire, and the AI will actually go for it. In my first attempt, I just get whittled down by Fire Spin by a lot, and by the time I make it to the Arcanine, a beefy neutral Fire Blast just puts me down. The second time is more of the same, but the fight basically boiled down to me rolling the dice on that 30% chance of Fire Spin to miss. Eventually, I do get some moves off and I can move past the Rapidash. Arcanine comes in, and winning still isn't guaranteed, but a first turn patented Blaine Super Potion into an Ice Beam that gets the lucky Freeze proc means that this battle is over. There's no thawing out in Generation 1, but and I don't know how often I mention this, but Generation 1 Freeze is just a death sentence and cannot be broken, and that's why I said it's over with, just to clarify. Now it's time to polish off the regular season on a positive note. I do the minimum, I head straight to Giovanni, and it goes without saying that Lapras has a great matchup here. Ice Beam can one-shot the Rhyhorn, but afterwards Doug Trio does get off a Sand Attack before the Ice Beam takes it out, and that means, obviously, that I'm going to miss my next Psychic on Nidal Queen, but a critical hit on the second one means that it just kind of evens out. Nidal King can survive one of my non-stab psychics, but we've come to expect that. And since Rhydon has low special, a super effective and stabbed Ice Beam can take it out in a single hit as well. And that's all the badges down, and I'm just trying to scoot along at this point. That leads us immediately into rival number 6, and I'm worried about our level to be honest, but let's just stay positive. Pidgeot is first. And I take a wing attack for some minor damage, but then my Ice Beam crits, takes it out, that's great. Rhyhorn also cannot survive an Ice Beam just like with Giovanni's, and we are quickly moving along in the fight. Growlithe is up next, and I figured some of you may wonder why I'm going for Ice Beam here, and on the Blaine fight, and that's because Ice is actually just neutral to Fire in Generation 1. While Fire is super effective against Ice, Fire doesn't resist Ice. It does hang on, it gets a potion, it goes down the next turn. Execute is next on the Ice Beam Rampage that I'm on, and it follows the previous Pokemon's fate with another one shot. So far this battle's going great. Alakazam is next and it's the sole reason that I have body slam in the moveset. It goes for side beam for some decent damage. I go for a body slam. It sets up a reflect then it heals but a crit does eventually take it out. I'm just honestly confused why body slam did so little damage initially. I had to rewatch the footage to see if maybe I got an attack drop somewhere but I guess the seven level advantage is to thank for that. Last up is blast toys and unsurprisingly thunderbolt does not one shot it. It uses its first turn to charge up a Skull Bash, and on turn 2 it does really heavy damage that was actually impressive, but a second Thunderbolt does finish it off the fight. It was a one shot, but I would not say that this fight 
was easy. Now on Victory Road, I'm still not battling any trainers, but I do opt to pick up the Rare Candy because I'm worried about only being level 44 at this point. It's uneventful and eventually we reach the final destination of the game. At this point I have 10 Rare Candies and since I have no badge boosting moves, I do use all of them before Lorelei. That means I'm level 54 and I'm starting out on even footing with the very first Dugong, but we already know that it's not going to be a run breaker to be slightly under leveled, so I'm not too concerned. Now let's take a look at the first Lorelei attempt. Lapras has all the ingredients to make this fight very easy. I outspeed the Dugong, but a Thunderbolt doesn't one hit it, no one's surprised by that. It goes for a takedown for barely any damage and a second Thunderbolt moves us on. Cloyster is next, and fortunately the Defense King of Generation 1 doesn't have a great special stat and a Thunderbolt moves us on in a single hit. Slowbro is next, and you guessed it, it's time for more Thunderbolt. It does get off a growl which is annoying, but my second Thunderbolt does finish it off. Jinx is next, since Slowbro got off a growl my attacks lowered, Ice Beam and Psychic are resisted, so Thunderbolt is really my only option so it's not great. Luckily Jinx can't do too much damage back to us, and it looked like it would have taken 3 Thunderbolts to take it out but we do get a crit on the second Thunderbolt and that saves us a turn. And last up we have the Lapras Mirror Match and fortunately Lorelai does not have access to those sweet TMs like we do. Thunderbolt is the obvious answer once again. It takes two to take out our brother, but overall this is a very easy start to the Elite Four. Albeit a little time consuming with all the extra turns, we're moving on. Now it's everyone's favorite shirtless trainer, Bruno. Guys, he really does try his best each and every week and you have to give him some credit for picking himself up off the ground and trying despite having no chance. With Ice Beam and Psychic in our move pool, this one was over before it even started, but honestly, in most runs, it's already over before we even begin the run. So let's just move on to Agatha, shall we? And unfortunately, this is where the dream run for Lapras ends. I do have Psychic, which always helps out, but with my level, I'm not going to outspeed any of the Gengars. It starts off with me getting confused, I hurt myself, I take a chunk of damage from Nightshade, and eventually I move on. The Go Bat's not a problem, I outspeed it and I speed can one hit it, but the Haunter is where the roadblock starts for this attempt. I outspeed it, Psychic does huge damage, but a Hypnosis into a Potion, several Dream Eaters, and a Confuse Ray puts me in a very bad position, and although I almost pull this one off, I can't quite survive another Nightshade. This is a very unlucky attempt and everything went wrong for me and I'm not really that worried. I make it back and on the second attempt the first two Pokemon go down just the same and this time I get off a Psychic on the Haunter just like the first time but it only goes for Nightshade this time and a follow up Ice Beam does get us past without dealing with those pesky status conditions. Arbok is next, it's just like Golbat, one shot from a Psychic is all we need and we're moving on to the real problem. And last up is that higher level Gengar. It goes for a Confuse Ray and of course I'm going to hurt myself immediately after that. It goes for a Nightshade on its next turn, and I'm getting very low. I get off a Psychic, but with Gengar's Elite Special stat, it only does about 60% of its health. I do need some luck here. It goes for Toxic. I hurt myself. Then Toxic does its damage. That's not really the luck that I wanted, but it does go for a Dream Eater while I'm not asleep, which is perfect, and a Psychic wins the battle despite us being at a mere 12 hit points. The penultimate fight of the run is against Lance, and Lapras is better equipped to deal with this fight more than it was for Lorelei. I have Thunderbolt for Gary, Ice Beam for the Dragons, and I have my choice for the Aerodactyl. The only thing that really even happens in this fight, and the only thing that's of note is that Aerodactyl does get off a bite since it outspeeds me, and it gives Chubb Jr. a nice little tickle. But this is a very easy fight. Dare I say it's even easier than Bruno in this run since Machamp can actually survive a move. Wow. Last we have the Champion. Rival number 5 and number 6 were easy, so what's going to change here? Well, the Pidgeot's not a problem. I breezed past it with ease, but once again, Alakazam shows why it's a top tier Pokemon and it just absolutely obliterates me. It outspeeds me and then it crits with a Psychic. Body Slam just isn't that strong on Lapras, can't one hit it, and a second Psychic takes me extremely low to 26 HP and while I can hang on, I get past it, I go a little bit further in the fight, the Arcanine eventually chips me down and forces our second reset of the Elite Four. Now let's take a look at the second attempt. Pidgeot goes for a useless Whirlwind. I get a crit and I make this one a one and done before moving on to the the bane of my existence, Spooncat. This time it doesn't crit.
crit, and it goes for the weaker move, so that's always great. I go for a body slam for about 50% damage. I get the paralysis proc, which means I outspeed it, and this one's done, right? No, I get a generation one, one out of 256 chance to miss on the lethal body slam damage, but luckily it just goes for another side beam, and while I am missing about 40% of my health, I move on with four Pokemon remaining. Right on is next, and a single ice beam is still good enough here to make it a one shot, so there's no issues here. Moving on. Arcanine is up next, and I don't have a solid answer, and this thing is thick. And boys, I'm talking about thick with three C's if you know what I mean. This thing takes about 26 body slams to take out, and it consistently chips away at me with Ember, and by the time I take it out, I'm at about 25% health. And that leads us to Executor. I have Ice Beam, and luckily I outspeed it, and I do crit because those eggs are also thick, but only with two C's this time. But still, I would hate to get put to sleep and just have my ass beat by stomps, so I'm glad we got past it in one shot. That leads us to Blastoise. I go for Thunderbolt, I get lucky with the Paralysis chance, and then I get even luckier with a full Paralysis turn skip, and since it's not in potion range, the battle's just over with another Thunderbolt. And that's it, Lapras has done it. And I had a good time with this run. It was pretty good, and Lapras is a personal favorite of mine. I actually use it in Pokemon Go to hit Legend rank in PvP, so I was very excited to do this run after the Nuzlocke. And before I talk more in detail about it, let's look at the hard numbers before I babble on a little bit. So Lapras finished with a level of 38, which isn't bad, but more importantly, it finishes with an in-game time of 3 hours and 19 minutes. That's not great, but it is respectable. It puts it just a couple of minutes below the pre-evolved King Ghastly and behind all of these second stage runs that I've done with the How Fast series. While I do think I could do this run again and save some time, at best I could move it up maybe one spot on the tier list, so there's no point in trying that. It's very similar to Starmie in the fact that it has a really slow and limited start, but unlike Starmie, Lapras just doesn't have that top tier special combined with that elite speed for crits and general safety to go first, and that allowed Starmie to really pick up steam and overcome the star. Lapras also suffers from its stats just being out of reach to one hit the majority of Pokemon in the run and that just added up over time. Combine that with no badge boosting moves and you just have the recipe for something that's just on the cusp of greatness but just barely misses the mark to be considered with the elites that can hit those sub three hour times. Now Lapras is a monster tank and it's got a very versatile moveset but what it all comes down to is that it's just not built to be the fastest and most efficient speed runner of generation one and that's fine i'm glad i did the run to see for myself either way i'm not mad about it so in the future i'm thinking about doing a jigglypuff run it was requested to me but I'm not looking forward to it. I'm not going to go into any details just yet, but you can do your own research and find out why this has the potential to be below Psyduck in the pre-Brock time. So yeah, it just doesn't sound great, but I'm up for the challenge. But I do think that's about all I have for you guys on this video. If you made it this far in the video, just know that I appreciate you, and I hope you've had a great week, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye!